It's good to see you this morning. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, good morning to you also. Uh, we're going to start this morning's service by standing and singing, There is Power in the Blood. You guys are slow getting up. <laughs> All right, here we go. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. everyone and welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church on this first Sunday of March and it is meteorological spring so it is spring it may not be at least by the month so welcome and happy spring to each one of you it's also the Lenten season so we are moving right along on that road to Easter, and we have quite a few announcements. And before I do that, don't let me forget to welcome anyone and everyone out there watching through our live stream, wherever or whenever you might be, we're happy you're with us as well. So moving into our announcements, I have a couple. We are continuing the collection for Bream and the food pantry out there. So please continue to bring food items. The cart set right up there before you as you come in. And in concert with that, our Cineshot youth are going to be collecting socks and sweats over the next couple of weeks to take to Bream Church for the homeless. Simply drop them off at the cart, entering the great room, or bring them to practice for you young folks. If you don't attend a man, you can collect through your church and bring them to practice. Every few weeks we will change what we are collecting so we can help the community. So if the church can help the youth by bringing socks and sweatpants in and collecting, there's a collection out there, you can see it. It would be greatly appreciated um, to give to Bream and for the homeless. 
Also, put a reminder in there, as we are thinking of Easter season, there is a handout um, regarding our journey to the cross, and I promise I'll do my best to not call it stations to the cross all season long. But the journey to the cross about volunteers, that's going to be on Good Friday, April the 15th. Um, you can read through your blue sheet right here about what all that entails. Your responsive reading is on the back. Um, also a reminder on April, there will be April 9th, the Children's Department is sponsoring a trip to the Easter Cave in Midford, Ohio. I haven't been to the Easter Cave, but I went to the Christmas Cave. Um, it is awesome what they do up there. And you also get the opportunity, when else are you gonna go through Mule Town, Ohio? Right, that's worth the drive, okay? You go through old Mule Town. And also today, about 10 minutes after service, uh, pastor is gonna have a listening session. Um, we're gonna open up some discussion about the upcoming um, new staff position. So if after church, about 10 minutes, everybody just comes to the front and we can have that listening session. Um, as we move to worship, as we go forward, uh, just a wonderful time of year. I want to read 1 Psalms 128 for our call to worship today. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants around about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace be upon Israel. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly thank you for the opportunity to worship, opportunity to fellowship, opportunity to sing, and we just praise you, Father, for the word of God and the preaching that we hear today. May your spirit be present and working and guiding and convicting us and drawing us into greater faith, and may you build your kingdom and utilize us to do your will in the Kanawha Valley. We thank you for the opportunity. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, Debbie will have a ministry moment. Come on up, Debbie. It's not a mission moment. That's not me. That's Shirley. Um, okay. Two years ago, we were awaiting a mission team from North Carolina to come and help us lead a three-day Bible school. We were eagerly anticipating selling, celebrating Easter with our new pastor. And students in Kanawha County were beginning spring break. Ten days later, our lives were changed forever. Kanawha County students would never enter a classroom the rest of that school year. And um, restaurants were closing. Um, everything was closing, and we got some new words in our vocabulary known as quarantine, pandemic, coronavirus, and my least favorite, social distancing. Because y'all know me, I like the hugging stuff. Anyway, and this became part of our attire everywhere we went. But luckily, two years later, things are different. They're not good. I mean, they're not the same, but they're different, and they're better. And things are opened up, and kids are back in school. And so because we have the opportunity to plan events, we are planning, Jackson, Jason actually mentioned, a, a trip to the Easter Cave in Minford, Ohio. Now, this is sponsored by me only because I'm in charge of the children. So it says children's ministry, but this is open to everyone at the church except for, I will have to tell you that it is not handicapped accessible at this point in time. But we are hoping to take a trip to the Easter Cave in Minford, Ohio on April 9th. We're planning to leave here about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, drive up together. We also will take the church van or bus or which, if we need it. We have a driver already scheduled and go through the cave and then either maybe meet somewhere for dinner afterwards and discuss what we saw. Or maybe if the weather's good, have a picnic somewhere but, and then come back to Charleston. So if you are interested in participating, just let me know. And if you need to go on the bus, let me know so we can kind of set up. And it is a free, they do ask for a dollar donation, but it is free to go through the cave. So if you have any questions, just see me later. Thank you.
Did you uh, did you enjoy Chuck Rhodes singing this morning? Yeah. Next Sunday, the gathering music will be Ed Marilyn Gaunch. So be sure and uh, get in here in time so you can enjoy that. Uh, this being the first Sunday in Lent, uh, I'm going to lead you in a, in a very small program this morning that involves a responsive reading and then two songs about the cross. And the, the theme of it is glory in the cross. So if you would stand as we do the responsive reading. I will read what is in red. Uh, the blue insert in your bulletin this morning has the responsive reading. I'll read what is in red, and you, the people, please read by responding in what is written in blue. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Father, glorify thy name. There came, therefore, a voice out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The multitude, therefore, who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. <clears throat> Fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's talk the last part together. But may it never be that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now we're going to sing the old rugged cross. Thank you. 
did my Savior bleed? As you can see, the deacons will be collecting the tithes and offerings coming around today, which is an excellent step forward. And let us go ahead and pray for these tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, we are so humbled and thankful for everything that you give us. We pray your blessings. We pray your grace be upon every last penny we give, and may it be utilized to build your kingdom in the Canal Valley. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And like my mic is on. There it is. All right. We are continuing in the book of Matthew throughout the Lenten season. We're going to be looking at some of the key moments in Jesus' life and ministry as we move toward uh, Easter. I want to encourage you, being the Lenten season, that over the next uh, several weeks, actually have about uh, five and a half weeks, that you will spend some time just reflecting on Jesus upon his life. Maybe you might want to read through the Gospels or, or uh, some aspect of the Gospels to allow you just to be focusing on his life. Lent is a time in the Christian calendar, and the church calendar, for us to just be still, to be quiet, to reflect upon this one who came to give his life for us. So I hope that you take advantage of the Lenten season to do so. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 9, starting with verse 35, reading through chapter 10, verse 4 for our text today. If you are able, if you would stand and join me in the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his fields. He said, he called his twelve disciples to him, gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus. Thaddeus, Simon the Selot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These are the twelve Jesus sent out with the instructions. May the Lord bless the reading and our hearing of his word today. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for these moments you've given us together today. And Lord, we pray that during this time that you would help our minds not to be racing ahead to events that we are anticipating today or the days yet to unfold. And equally, Lord, not to be caught in the yesterdays of life, but for these precious few moments. May we follow the example of Mary, who sat at your feet, and you said she chose what was best and it would not be taken from her. So, Lord, may we sit at your feet today, and may we receive your word as your spirit delivers it to us, a word that would give us challenge, a word that would give us comfort, a word that would encourage us, inspire us, whatever the need or situation may be in our hearts. Lord, may you minister to us through these times, these moments that we share together. And Lord, I ask that you take these simple words I have prepared and allow them to be a means by which you speak your message into our hearts this day. I ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, good. Things haven't really changed from the Sermon on the Mount. We're still in that first year of Jesus' ministry. And there are people following him from all over the region. Not just Galilee, not just Judea, but even Perea, even the Decapolis. The word of Jesus' life and ministry was spreading because he taught with such authority. We looked at that through the first two months of the year. We looked at the Sermon on the Mount and how it impacted and called the people to live a different life. And there were those that were following him on a daily basis. There were others that were coming periodically throughout the week. There were others that when he would come to a particular region or a particular town, that they would come to hear him, and some might follow him for a season. But Jesus is in this Galilean ministry, and he's teaching, he's preaching, and he's healing. That's his purpose in coming, is to proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. God is moving in a new way. It's no longer going to be keeping the law as has been in the past for the Jewish people, but it's now where the word of God is written upon the heart, not upon some tablet, not upon a scroll being read, but written upon their heart. And as they walk in that new life with this relationship with Jesus Christ, that's the message he's proclaiming. It's the kingdom of God entering into this world in preparation for when we all get to be a part of that kingdom eternally in heaven. As Jesus is walking and teaching, he is preaching, he's teaching in the synagogues. Boy, that is really, is it my coat? Could be? Okay. Sorry. 
That's going to be annoying. See if that takes care of it. Oh, thanks. Thank you. See if that takes care of it. Might just be that. All right. Where was I? He was teaching in their synagogues. He was going from town to town. He was going to towns like Chiron, like Hazar. He was going to Nain and Cain. He was going throughout the region, even to his hometown of Nazareth. And everywhere he went, each town he went to, he went into the synagogues. And being a rabbi, being this itinerant rabbi, he was often invited to teach. And so the scroll would be brought and it would be opened up. And then he would read at the assigned text for the day and then the scroll would be put back in his sepulcher into its ark and then he would sit and he would teach those in the synagogue and people were amazed. The preaching was happening as he went around in the hillsides, on the fields, in the valleys. As Jesus went along as the people were following him, he would periodically stop and he would teach and he would share and he would proclaim and throughout it all people in need were coming to Jesus. Those with leprosy, those that were blind, those that were crippled, those that were lame, those that had been outcast for whatever reason, they were coming to Jesus that they might be touched and their lives changed. That's a wonderful ministry. And as the disciples are following him, as many others are following him, again, it's not just 12, it's hundreds. And some days it's thousands that come and follow Jesus that day to see what's taking place. Everything is wonderful. And I'm sure as Peter and James and John and the others looked out upon the crowds that were gathering to see Jesus, they were like, wow, this is great, right? Wouldn't you? I mean, if you were walking with Jesus and there were hundreds of people coming to hear the message, you were seeing countless lives changed physically, and many changed spiritually as he would speak into their lives, as you witnessed as he sat in the synagogues and he would teach with such authority and such power, you'd say everything was great. But Jesus, when he looked upon that mass of people, that mass of humanity that was coming and following him and centering around him, Jesus didn't see the same thing the disciples saw. For he did not see this mass of people excited about what God was doing, anticipating. But what he saw was people that were like sheep without a shepherd. They were helpless. They were harassed. Fear gripped many of their lives. You know, it's hard for me to grasp. I try to get a hold of this periodically in my life. I'll just stop and I really take some time to think what it would be like to live in a nation that's occupied. That's hard for me to grasp. I have never been in a nation that is occupied by another. I mean, there's a Roman soldier on every street corner. They're coming to your home searching periodically. They're excising great tribute back to the, to the empire. And you have no recourse. You're lucky to have a normal day. I mean, I just, I can't begin to grasp that. They were gripped with fear. There were others that were caught up in shame because if they had fallen in some way and, and, and messed up in the religious laws of the day, they hadn't done what the Pharisees had done, or they missed going to synagogue to the Sadducees, or I'm sorry, to temple with the Sadducees to offer sacrifice and to meet there at some festival or some feast. They could be put out. I mean, it had become such an overwhelming weight. Jesus even said to the Pharisees at one point, you put many great loads upon the people, do nothing to lift a finger to help them. I mean, that's the situation. They are literally helpless. They cannot change what day-to-day -day life is. And they're harassed in every way imaginable. And when Jesus looks upon that mass of people, he's not seeing great ministry. He's moved with compassion. I love that Greek word. It's splanknia. I just love it. It literally translates, your guts get pulled inside out. That's the picture. I mean, when Jesus looks at this mass, he's not applying, he's not excited, he's not saying, hey, it's another great day in ministry. He looks upon humanity and sees the brokenness that Satan has brought through sin and its grip, and he's moved. 
He's moved from deep within. He's got to do something, and he is doing something. He's going to each town. He's going to each synagogue. He's gathering in areas, but it's just how many? One. And so he turns to his disciples, and this is more than just the 12 at this point, folks. It's many that are following him on a regular basis, and he says to do what? He says, I want you to pray. I want you to see what I see. I want you to experience what I am feeling in my life. I want you to look upon this world as I see it. I'm not seeing what's on the surface. I'm seeing what's in the hearts. And I'm seeing hearts that are broken, hearts that are in pain, hearts that are suffering. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray because the harvest is plentiful. The fields are white. It's time to move. So I want you to pray to the Lord of the harvest to what? Send workers because we don't have enough. There's many to be reached. There's many lives to be touched. There's many that need to hear the good news. And so you pray that God will send into his harvest field workers. Would you agree we're in a world that's in desperate need? Would you agree that we're in a time when hearts are open and sensitive and searching for some solution? Okay, we see it. Everyone's chasing after all the self-help and all the philosophies and isms and studies and out there. There's such need. It's really not a whole lot different. And I think Jesus is saying to you and to me, we need to be on our faces before God in prayer, seeking the Lord of the harvest that he might send workers out in the fields. And some of those fields may be some far off place, and some of those fields might be just across the street from our house. Lord, send workers. I could stop there, and that would be great. But Matthew goes on to tell us. Jesus turns to the twelve. He turns to Simon and Andrew and James and John, to Philip, to Bartholomew, to Thomas, to Matthew, to uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, to Thaddeus, to Simon the Zealot, to Judas Iscariot. He is even the one who will eventually betray. He turns to them. And what's it say he does in chapter 10, verse 1? He gave them authority. He gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Did you hear what he did? They've been praying, God send someone, and Jesus turns to them and he gives them authority as he calls his 12 out now to be that inner circle of disciples who will walk with him and live with him and follow him. He gives them authority and power. They've been hearing for eight, eight nine months now in ministry. They've heard the account of the, of the Kim kingdom. They've seen how Jesus has operated. They've watched what he's done. And so as they've been watching and then doing some ministry with him, he now turns to them and gives them authority and power and says what? Go and teach. Go throughout all of Israel. Go throughout the Galilee. Go throughout Judea. Don't enter into the pagan areas. Go to your brothers and sisters and tell them the good news. Announce the message that is coming. He calls the twelve. Oh, hit the wrong button. And sends them out. Friends, God calls with the intent to send. He doesn't call us to a boardroom. He doesn't call us to a study group. I don't mean Bible study group. I mean a study group to look at a problem, try to analyze, come up with projects. No. He sends us to the place that's in need. He sends us 
to be relational and touch lives and see lives change for all eternity. He sends us. He sent those 12. He sent them to those places that he had not yet gone. And they're to go to every little village, every little town throughout Galilee, throughout Judea, and they're to go and announce the kingdom is at hand, to call the people to repentance. And to call them to, to follow Jesus, to follow his teaching and anticipate the day when all unfolds. And he's given them the power to be able to do the miracles he has done. Because, friends, the reason Jesus did miracles from the beginning of his ministry was not to do miracles, but was so that the Jews, and especially the Jewish leadership, would see those miracles and know that he is from God, the message is from God. That's the purpose. And so he gives those 12 disciples the same authority and the same power that they will be able to go out, and they do. And they go and spread the good news. They go announce to the world that Christ has come. Messiah is here. The day we've been waiting has finally arrived. It's a call he gave to those men. An invitation, a challenge, the call that comes from God to those disciples, the call that comes to us from our Lord Almighty is an invitation, but it's an invitation with expectation that we respond. It's not an invitation to just hear and let cast aside. It's not an invitation just to hear and think about and reflect upon and say, you know, that's a pretty good idea. It's a call to hear an invitation to join in taking the news of life into the world that's broken and dying. A chance for us to get to join in that work that Christ has done and is doing. He completed it on the Christ cross and now he sends us out. And he sends us out into a broken and dying world. That broken and dying world for some times will be in our family group. There will be individuals who are outside a relationship with God, and he'll place us there so that we can be a light that points to Jesus, who places us there so that we can talk to them and encourage them and come alongside them, and that we will show them God's love and also be pointing them in the direction they need to go, to gently come along and journey with them through those painful moments, through those times of brokenness and loss, to be there, to be present so that they will hear and see in our lives and hear from our words this message of life found in Christ. Sometimes that broken world is our neighborhood. To have eyes that see it as Jesus sees it and to look upon those that are suffering right where we live and to be about ministering to those needs. And it may be just as simple as a cup of cool water, a word of kindness and encouragement, maybe even an act that we can do to make life a little bit easier. If I were preaching this two months ago, go scrape their car windows when you do yours. So when they come out, it's done. And they don't even have to know who did it. Things like that, that we go into that broken world and we impact the world. Where that salt and light we talked about for the last two months. Sometimes that broken world is our community, beyond the little place where we live and those neighbors that we interact with. It may be beyond that, that we see that. And it may be a response where, where we become engaged in some sort of community service. Maybe it's just reading a book to someone at the library or the school or the Bob Burdett Center. Maybe it's taking time to, to come alongside a family and, and to mentor them and disciple them and, and help them. Maybe it's going to be engaging and helping at the soup kitchen or bringing food or the sweatpants and, and socks like right now for Bream. 
the minister to the homeless here on the West. Maybe it's going to it's gonna take lots of form, but the call God's given to us is an invitation and with the expectation that as God guides and directs, we will follow. And sometimes that broken world is even beyond our community to our state and even across the world where we may not physically be able to go. But in the fall, we might pack a shoebox for Operation Christmas Child and it'll go somewhere with the gospel where we're not going to be. Or maybe it's where we get on our knees and pray for the missionaries of our state that are going around the globe sharing the gospel of Christ and that we might support them in our prayers and in our finances so they can have the means to be able to be there and to engage. Maybe it's that we respond to some disaster in the world around us or in the crisis that we see even in the moment that we find a, a, a reputable means by which we might contribute to be aid to those that are suffering and broken. See, we live in a broken world. And the call God has given to each of us is not just come follow me, but to engage the world on my behalf. The call has come. The call has been made. And it's to a broken and dying world that we are called to go. And so the question is, will you respond? Because with an invitation, an invitation that Jesus is expecting us to say yes and come alongside, we can still say yes or we can say no. If we say no, you know what? God still loves us. That doesn't change anything. But we're missing out because from my own experience, and some of you could stand up here and give testimony too, it's neat when you have the chance to go and do something and you think, I'm going to go help that person. And when you get done and you go home, you go, boy, I think I got more out of that than they did. You go visit somebody that's not well. And to spend that time and you leave on top of the world and you came to give them that. Or you meet someone's need and you're able to respond to that need as God directs and to make a difference. The call of God comes to all. It came to those 12. And even among the 12, there's one that's not with him. They're just following him. Judas Iscariot. He doesn't really have a heart for Christ, but he's there for whatever his motivation and he's equally given the call and the responsibility to go forth. Today, friends, God gives us a call. The call is to each and every one of us. And his call today is right where we're at. For someone today, the call may be to step into relationship with him. We've not made that decision. You have not come to the point in life, regardless of age, where you have confessed to Christ that you are a sinner and you need to be saved. And you have surrendered and allow him to come in to be your Savior and to be your Lord. Maybe that's the call he has for you today. And we want to invite you in a few moments when we sing a familiar song that you would come and, and ask Jesus to come in and save you and become Lord of your life. And what's so exciting is he will. In that moment, he's just waiting for us to respond. So if you need that today, hear his call to come into salvation. For some, the call is that call to go out, to begin to look around you because I believe he gives us daily divine appointments people's lives that we will touch and through our actions and our words they will experience the message of the good news about Jesus. That we'll have the opportunity to reach out in love and to touch them in a way that it will forever change their course for eternity. And sometimes that may be that we are planting seeds that someone else will harvest someday. Sometimes we're just coming along and we're helping to break up the soil a little bit and put some water on that seed so that it can grow one day. And occasionally we are the privileged person to be there when that time of fruit and harvest. For those of us who follow him, those of us who are in relationship with him, the call is to be engaging our world around us as he directs us. Don't run ahead. We can make a mess of things, and we do that sometimes. 
but prayerfully, because that's the first thing. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray to the Lord Jesus Christ to show you, to help you to have eyes to see so that you can walk redeeming the time around you. To be able to see that person that you may simply just go sit beside and listen, because that's where it begins. And then once we've listened, then we can begin to tell them our story. And then to guide them. It's kind of like Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch, right? When he came up along the chariot, Acts chapter 8, he simply said, do you know what you're reading? <laughs> That's pretty simple. He didn't come and say, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? No, he said, do you know what you're reading? And then he sat with him and talked with him and shared with him. And by the end of that ride, the Ethiopian eunuch's baptized as a new believer in Christ. See, it's that journey is coming alongside. Maybe that's what it's going to look like. I want to encourage you that you will hear his call on a daily basis and engage, especially in the season of Lent. If we're focusing our lives on Jesus, taking time daily to reflect on who he is, to read something out of the Gospels, to, to look at his life and to ponder it and reflect upon it, it's going to position us to be ready that when he brings us across that path of that person that just needs a word of encouragement, that needs a touch from him, that needs to hear the message of Christ, we're going to be ready. And we'll be able to then pour into that person's life the truth that will forever change it. And maybe this morning his call might be to you to be a part of this church family. You know, our Baptist policy and tradition is that if you want to be a part of this, this family, is it's a decision that you make public, that you come and ask and so if God is calling you to be a part of this church family during this song, this invitation, it's an invitation to you to today become a part of this church family by coming and asking, presenting yourself for membership. But that's based on the fact that you have a relationship with Jesus. And if you haven't accepted Jesus in coming today, you can become a part. I believe God's calling. And he's calling each and every one of us. He's redeemed us to follow him. To be fishers of men. To change the world around us. To announce the good news. To be making a difference in the world he's placed us in. We get to tell the world about the rock-solid foundation we're building our life on. We get to tell. That's our job. Tell. Share. Invest. It's going to cost you time. I'll tell you that up front. It's not easy. It's not quick. Don't, don't memorize your five-minute presentation, drop it, and walk away. Hope it did something. <laughs> it's engaging. It's sharing. It's living. And I'll assure you, in today's world and climate coming out of the pandemic, if people see you at peace, and they see you with an assurance deep within and a joy that's coming out of that relationship with Christ, they're going to want some. And they're going to ask you where you found it. Walk in such a way that we can share with the world the good news about Jesus Christ, the rock-solid foundation of our faith. Jesus is calling. Will you respond? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these moments. And Lord, we thank you for this account that Matthew gives us of how they've been walking with you. And when you saw the crowds, you saw how they were helpless and how they were harassed by the things of this world. Help us, Lord, to walk through our path today and tomorrow, and the next day, with eyes open to see as you see. And Lord, may we be able to have the privilege to announce and declare good news that there is abundant life right now in a relationship with you and the promise that we have eternity to share with you. Lord, may we be faithful to share that each day. And Lord, this morning, if there's someone that needs to enter into that relationship, I pray that they would hear your Spirit's invitation today. They would hear your call to come. 
Lord, we're going to sing about you being that rock-solid foundation. May we build our life upon you. And may we share that invitation you give us with those around us to come join us, to come live life to the full, to have the joy of relationship with you each day, being able to experience the joy that that brings. Lord, use this time of invitation to draw each one of us the step you would have us take. May we be obedient to your guidance, to the guidance of your spirit. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let's stand and sing. Julie has been worshiping with us about a month, and uh, she is uh, from the area now, and originally from Virginia, but she has come this morning asking for church membership, and so I want to encourage you following communion to seek her out and give her a, a welcoming and affirmation as she has made the decision to come and be a part of our church family. Okay? God bless you. Thank you. Nancy's going to be right here with you. I'm going to ask the deacons to come up front because this being the first Sunday of the month, it is our practice to have uh, communion together to come to the Lord's table. As they're coming, I want to give the invitation of the Lord to come to his table. This table is the Lord's, not Emmanuel Baptist Church's. So if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you remember our church or not, we invite you to partake of the elements as they are past us. Our, our practice is, is that we will serve you the bread and the cup and ask that you hold them till everyone's had a chance to be served, that we might eat and drink together, remembering our Lord and Savior who redeemed us and saved us through his sacrifice upon the cross. As we look at the accounts in the gospel, and as Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he explains that on the night that Jesus is betrayed, 
that he took from the Passover table he was celebrating with his disciples, bread and the cup. As he took the bread, he blessed it, then he broke it, and he gave it to them, told them to eat in remembrance of him. And then he took the cup, and after he blessed it, he passed it around and told them to all drink from it in remembrance of him. So in just a few moments, as the elements are passed, I encourage you to take some time to examine your own heart. And as you hold those elements, to consider how he offered his body upon the cross for you. And how he shed his sinless blood for you. This was for you. And as we do so, we remember that we might go forth to proclaim that news. As he blessed those elements, I'm going to ask John Tucker to have a blessing on the bread and cup today. Shall we pray? Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for everything you've given us. Lord, may we take the, the bread and the cup seriously this morning. May we examine each one of our, our uh, lives and our souls that we might uh, be sinless before you because we've accepted your love. Lord, we pray your blessing upon the, this uh, bread and the cup as we take it this morning. And be with us as we walk through the day. May we always stand for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
As we consider the bread, Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. So as oft as you eat of it to do so, remembering me. So I invite you to eat together, remembering Christ Jesus, our Lord. With the cup, he said, this is my blood, shed sowing a new covenant between God and man through the remission of sin. Said, as often as you drink of it, do so remembering me. Let us drink together, remembering Christ our Lord. It says, after that, in the Gospels, that they sang a hymn, I went out to the Mount of Olives to pray. I'm going to invite you to sing the first verse of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. And then if you're staying for the listening session, come to the front of the sanctuary here. If not, I pray that you have a great week and God just blesses you richly with opportunities to tell somebody this week the story of Jesus. God bless you.